The Chronicles of Prydane by Lloyd Alexander. Book Four, Taran Wanderer. Chapter Nineteen, The Potter's Wheel. I've told you where you are. The man went on good-naturedly as Tarn dismounted at the bank of the stream. Now might you be willing to tell me who you are, and what brings you to a place whose name you must ask? Have you lost your way and found Marin when you sought another comet? I am called Wanderer, Tarn replied. As for losing my way, he added with a laugh, <laughs> I can't say that I have, for I'm not sure myself where my path lies. Then Marin is as fair a place as any to break your journey, the man said. Come along, if you'd see what hospitality I can offer the two of you. As the man dropped a last spadeful of clay into the wooden buckets, Tarn stepped forward and offered to carry them, and, since the man did not refuse, set his shoulders under the yoke. But the buckets were heavier than Tarn reckoned. His brow soon burst out in sweat. He could barely stagger along under the load he felt doubling at every pace, and the hut to which the man pointed seemed to grow farther instead of closer. If you seek Dob to mend your chimney, Tarn gasped, you've come a long way to find it. Ah, you've not caught the trick of that yoke, said the man, grinning broadly at Tarn's effort. He shouldered the buckets, which Tarn gladly gave back, and strode along so briskly, despite the weight of his burden, that he nearly outdistanced the companions. Arriving at a long shed, he poured the clay into a great wooden vat, then beckoned the wayfarers to enter his hut. Inside, Tarn saw racks and shelves holding earthenware of all kinds, vessels of plain baked clay, graceful jars, and among these, at random, pieces whose craftsmanship and beauty made him catch his breath. Only once, in the treasure house of Lord Gast, had he set eyes on handiwork such as this. He turned astonished to the old man who had begun laying dishes and bowls on an oaken table. When I asked if you sought Dob to mend your chimney, I spoke foolishly, Tarn said, humbly bowing. If this is your work, I have seen some of, some of it before, and I know you, Anlaw Clay Shaper. The potter nodded. Oh, my work it is. If you've seen it, it may be that indeed you do know me, for I am old at my craft, wanderer and no longer sure where the clay ends and Anlaw begins. <laughs> or, in truth, if they're not one and the same. Tarn looked closer at the vessels crowding the hut, at the newly finished wine bowl shaped even more skillfully than the one in Lord Gast's trove, at the long clay-spattered tables covered with jars of paints, pigments, and glazes. Now he saw in wonder that what he had first taken for common scullery ware was as beautiful in its own way as the wine bowl. All had come from a master's hand. He turned to Anlaw. It was told me, Tarn said, that one piece of your making is worth more than all of a Cantrev Lord's treasure house, and I will believe it. And here, he shook his head in amazement, this is a treasure house in itself. Yes, yes, Gurgi cried. Oh, skillful potter gains riches and fortunes with clever shapings. <laughs> Riches and fortune, replied Anlaw, smiling. Food for my table, rather. Most of these pots and bowls I send to the small comets where the folk have no potter of their own. As I give what they need, they give what I need, and treasure is what I need the least. My joy is in the craft, not the gain. Would all the fortunes in Prydain help my fingers shape a better bowl? There are those, Tarn said, half in earnest, as he glanced at the potter's wheel, who claim work such as yours comes by enchantment. At this, Anla threw back his head and laughed heartily. <laughs> I wish it did, for it would spare much toil. No, no, wanderer. My wheel, alas, is like any other. Ah, yeah, true it is, he added. That Gavonian, the lame, master craftsman of Priday, long ago fashioned all manner of enchanted implements. He gave them to who he deemed would use them wisely and well. But one by one they fell into the clutches of R and Death Lord. Now all are gone. But Gavonian, too, discovered and set down the high secrets of all crafts, Anlaw went on. 
These as well are in stole to hoard in Anuvan, where none may ever profit from them. The potter's face turned grave. A lifetime have I striven to discover them again, to guess what might have been their nature. Much have I learned, learned by doing, as a child learns to walk. Ah, uh, but my steps falter. The deepest lore yet lies beyond my grasp. I fear it ever shall. Let me gain this lore, Anlaw said, and I'll yearn for no magical tools. Let me find the knowledge. And these, he added, holding up his clay-crusted hands, these will be enough to serve me. But you know what you seek, Tarn answered. I, alas, seek without knowing even where to look. He then told Anla of Heviad the smith and Dwyvak the weaver woman, of the sword and cloak he had made. I was proud of my work, Tarn went on, yet at the end neither anvil nor loom satisfied me. Uh, what of the potter's wheel? asked Anla. When Tarn admitted he knew nothing of this craft and prayed Anla to let him see the shaping of clay, the old potter willingly agreed. Anla drew up his coarse robe and seated himself at the wheel. Which, we, which he quickly set spinning, and on it flung a lump of clay. The potter bent almost humbly to his work, and reached out his hands as tenderly as if he were lifting an unfledged bird. Before Tarin's eyes, Anla began shaping a tall, slender vessel. As Tarin stared in awe, the clay seemed to shimmer on the swiftly turning wheel and to change from moment to moment. Now Tarin understood Anla's words. For indeed, between the potter's deft fingers and the clay, he saw no separation, as though Anlaw's hands flowed into the clay and gave it life. Anlaw was silent and intent. His lined face had brightened, the years fallen away from it. Tarn felt his heart fill with a joy that seemed to reach from the potter to himself, and in that moment understood that he was in the presence of a true master craftsman, greater than any he had ever known. Fluider was wrong. Tarin murmured. If there is enchantment, it lies not in the potter's wheel, but in the potter. Enchantment there is none, answered Anla, never turning from his work. A gift, perhaps, but a gift that bears with it much toil. If I could make a thing of such beauty, it is toil I would welcome, Tarin said. Sit you down, then, said Anla, making room for Tarin at the wheel. Shape the clay for yourself. When Tarn protested he would spoil Anlaw's half-formed vessel, the potter only laughed. <laughs> spoil it you will, surely. I'll toss it back into the kneading trough, mix it with the other clay, and sooner or later it will serve again. It will not be lost. Indeed, nothing ever is, but comes back in one shape or another. But for yourself, Tarn said, the skill you have already put in will be wasted. The potter shook his head. Not so. Craftsmanship isn't like water in an earthen pot to be taken out by the dipper full until it's empty. No, the more drawn out, the more remains. The heart renews itself, wanderer, and skill grows all the better for it. Here, then, your hands, uh, thus. Your thumbs, uh, thus. From the first moment, Tarn felt the clay whirling beneath his fingers. His heart leaped with the same joy he had seen on the potter's face. The pride of forging his own sword and weaving his own cloak dwindled before this new discovery that made him cry out in sudden delight. But his hands faltered and the clay went awry. Anla stopped the wheel. Tarn's first vessel was so lopsided and misshapen that, despite his disappointment, he threw back his head and laughed. Anla clapped him on the shoulder. Well tried, wanderer. The first bowl I turned was as ill-favored ill and worse. <laughs> You have the touch for it, but before you learn the craft, you must first learn the clay. Dig, sift, and knead it. Know its nature better than that of your closest companion. Then grind pigments for your glazes. Understand how the fire of the kiln works upon them. Anlaw clay shaper, Tarn said in a low voice that hid nothing of his yearning. Will you teach me your craft? This more than all else I long to do. Anla hesitated several moments and looked deeply at Tarn. I can teach you only what you can learn, said the potter. How much that may be, time will tell. Stay, if that is your wish. Tomorrow we shall begin. The two wayfarers made themselves comfortable that night in a snug corner of the pottery shed. 
Gurgi curled on the straw pallet, but Tarn sat with knees drawn up and arms clasped about them. It's strange, he murmured. The more the Comet folk I've known, the fonder I have grown of them. Yet Comet Marin draw, drew me at first sight, closer than all the others. The night was soft and still. Tarn smiled wistfully in the darkness. The moment I saw it, I thought it, I thought at the one place I'd be content to dwell, and that, that even Ilanwe might be happy here. And at Anlaw, and at Anlaw's wheel, he went on, when my hands touched the clay, I knew I would count myself happy to be a potter, more than smithing, more than weaving. It's, it's as though I could speak through my fingers, as though I could give shape to what was in my heart. I understand what Anlaw meant. There's no difference between him and his work. Indeed, Anlaw puts himself into the clay and makes it live with his own life. If I, too, might learn to do this? Gurgi did not answer. The weary creature was fast asleep. Tarn smiled and drew the cloak over Gurgi's shoulders. Sleep well, he said. We may have come to the end of our journey. Anlaw was as good as his word. In the days that followed, the potter showed Tarn skills no less important than the working of the clay itself. The finding of proper earths, judging their texture and quality, sifting, mixing, tempering. Gurgi joined Tarn in all the tasks, and soon his shaggy hair grew so crusted with dust, mud, and gritty glaze that he looked like an unbaked clay pot set on a pair of skinny legs. The summer sped quickly and happily, and the more Tarn saw the potter at his craft, the more he marveled. At the kneading trough, Anlaw pounded the clay with greater vigor than heavy of the smith at his anvil, and at the wheel did the most intricate work with a deftness surpassing even that of Dwyvak, the weaver woman. As early as he rose in the morning, Tarn always found the potter already up and about his tasks. Anlaw was tireless, often spending nights without sleep and days without food, absorbed in labor at his wheel. Seldom was the potter content to repeat a pattern, but strove to better even what he himself had originated. Stale water is a poor drink, said Anlaw. Stale skill is worse, and the man who walks in his own footsteps only ends where he began. Not until autumn did Anlaw let Tarin try his hand at the wheel again. This time the bowl Tarin shaped was not as ill-formed as the other. Anlaw, studying it carefully, nodded his head and told him, you have learned a little, wanderer. Nonetheless, to Tarn's dismay, Anlaw cast the bowl into the kneading trough. Never fear, the potter said. When you shape one worth the keeping, it will be fired in the kiln. Though Tarn feared such a time might never come, it was not long before Anlaw judged a vessel, a shallow bowl, simple in design, yet well proportioned, to be ready for firing. He set it, along with other pots and bowls he had crafted for the folk of Kamat Isaf into a kiln taller and deeper than heavy its furnace. While Anlaw calmly turned to fi finishing other vessels for the Comet folk, Tarn's anxiety grew until he felt that he himself was baking in the flames. But at last, when the firing was done and the pieces had cooled, the potter drew out the bowl, turned it around in his hands as Tarn waited breathlessly, and tapped it with a clay-rimmed finger. He grinned at Tarn. It rings true. Beginner's work, wanderer, but not to be ashamed of. Tarn's heart lifted as if he had fashioned a wine bowl handsomer than even Lord Gast had seen. But his joy changed soon to despair. Though through autumn, Tarn shaped other vessels, yet to his growing dismay, none satisfied him. None matched his hopes, despite the painful toil he poured into the work. Ah, what lacks? he cried to Anlaw. I could forge a sword well enough and weave a cloak well enough, but now what I truly long to grasp is beyond my reach. Must the one skill I sought above all be denied me? He burst out in an anguished voice. Is the gift forbidden me? He bowed his head and his heart froze even as he spoke the words, for he knew within himself he had touched the truth. Anlaw did not gainsay him, but only looked at him for a long while with deep sadness. Why? Tarn whispered. Why is this so? It is a heavy question, Anlaw replied at last. He put a hand on Tarn's shoulder. Indeed, no man can answer it. There are those who have labored all their lives to gain the gift, striving until the end, only to find themselves mistaken. 
and those who had it born in them yet never knew, those who lost heart too soon, and those who should never have begun at all. Count yourself lucky, the potter went on, that you have understood this now and not spent your years in vain hope. This much you have learned, and no learning is wasted. What then shall I do? Taran asked. Grief and bitterness such, he has not, such as he had not known in Craddock's Valley flooded over him. There are more ways to happiness than in the shaping of a pot, replied Anlaw. You have been happy in Marin. You still can be. There is work for you to do. Your help is welcome and valuable to me, as a friend as much as an apprentice. Why, look you now, he went on in a cheerful tone. Tomorrow I would send my ware to Kamadisov, but a day's journey is long for one of my years. As a friend, will you bear the burden for me? Taran nodded. I will carry your ware to Isav. He turned away, knowing that his happiness was ended, like a flawed vessel shattered in the firing. <laughs>